This lecture is part of the History 363 Modern Africa class at Flagler College. Uh, the topic for this lecture is very broad. Um, uh, it's entitled The Scramble for Africa, um, but really this is a we're covering uh, a whole period here from about the um, 1870s up to the end of World War One, and uh, this would normally probably in a regular classroom class be broken into a couple of different classes. Um, and so uh, I'm not going to give every detail about this. Um, a lot of the examples uh, will have to be uh, obtained by by students through reading the textbook and looking into the other literature. Um, also in this class we will, uh, in this lecture I will talk uh, for a few minutes at least about um, the assigned monograph for this week, um, which is King Leopold's Ghost by Adam Hochschild. Um, so we have this period in the late 19th century which has been called the Scramble for Africa, um, and that is the time in which uh, Europeans uh, to establish firm control over Africa um, and did so really in a, in a rather haphazard fashion and often in competition with each other, hence the name Scramble. Um, there is, of course, background to this, <clears throat> some of which um, is problematic uh, in terms of uh, historical thinking about this, but uh, which we still need to at least acknowledge. And one very important, very large piece of that background, so which we really can't do justice to here, is the whole context of 19th century Europe. Um, a famous, though I think now dated, uh, study of the 19th century by the great uh, his, uh, English historian A.J.P. Taylor was entitled The Struggle for Mastery in Europe. And Taylor uh, and others have seen the 19th century really from uh, the time of the French Revolution, or at least from the end of the reign of Napoleon uh, through the end of the First World War as this uh, intense time of, uh, of struggle, um, of rivalries uh, that grew into uh, eventually leading to massive conflagrations uh, such as the First World War. Um, uh, really, that's kind of the culmination of this whole 19th century process. There were other wars uh, that were lesser in scope before that, the Franco-Prussian War of uh, eight, the uh, early 1870s um, being a, a good example. Um, and there's no doubt that the rivalries that existed in Europe did contribute to um, the uh, African history of this period, uh, to the way that Europeans dealt with Africa. Uh, however, to tell the story of African history in this period entirely from this vantage point is problematic because it makes Africa into a passive recipient of this, uh, these expansionist tendencies and the playing out of these rivalries among Europeans. Uh, the African simply becomes a, a, a passive part of the broader landscape of, uh, of the world, uh, which is dominated by Europe. Um, as we'll see, that understanding of late 19th century African history is very problematic. Um, but uh, uh, we do need to certainly acknowledge these rivalries that developed in 19th century Europe and, and, and see this period of mastery as, or the struggle for mastery is important. Uh, we also need to acknowledge the emergence um, into its full-blown form of uh, racism, um, European or Western racism. Now, this is a very loaded term. Uh, I almost hesitate even to uh, confront it, but of course we need to in discussing this, this topic. Um, uh, European racism, uh, 19th century form, um, had its antecedents in earlier eras. Um, uh, for those of you who may have taken the Keystone Seminar, um, you will see some of the antecedents, you would have seen some of the antecedents uh, uh, for this um, uh, in things like the letter of Columbus upon his you know, discovery uh, of what he thought was Asia but was really the Americas, uh, where he talks about the peoples of the, these lands as um, both innocent and um, perhaps a bit sinister. 
um, and savage, uh, certainly underdeveloped relative to Europeans. Uh, also, uh, explorations of this in things like Shakespeare's The Tempest and some of the essays of Montaigne, um, and uh, you know, on through uh, many of the key texts of the Enlightenment. There emerged in these earlier periods this notion of uh, the peoples of uh, countries outside of Europe, particularly Africa and uh, among the Native Americans. Um, the, 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 those inhabitants were um, simultaneously innocent uh, and thus, you know, potentially moldable into um, uh, into civilized people, potentially even into kind of utopian communities. Um, uh, the the distant lands of the newly discovered world, uh, whether we're talking about the Americas or, or Africa or the Pacific Islands or or whatever, uh, were seen as uh, potentially uh, by some Europeans as places where. Uh, some social engineering, some social experiments could be brought about, and, and we've seen that in Africa uh, there were a couple of attempts to do this in, in Sierra Leone and Liberia um, and a couple of other places. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the uh, African is innocent and, and potentially moldable. Um, there may even be some commendable things about him. Um, sorry for the lack of gender neutral language there. Uh, there may be some commendable things about him, but on the other hand, his civilization is savage. And in uh, that, that word actually had a great deal of potency in 19th century thought. This was uh, the, the stage of savagery was thought to be this initial primitive stage of the development of, uh, of humankind. Um, there was an interim stage known as barbarism, and then finally the uh, the concluding stage in this um, three period scheme uh, was civilization. Savages um, acted in ways that were brutal and cruel um, and violent. Uh, they had a lack of self control when it came to things like violence and and uh, sex. Um, they, uh, I mean, this this is sort of the standard caricature. But on the other hand, as I said, they were moldable and to some extent innocent because they didn't know any better. So that's what goes into this this image of the noble savage. Well, you can see, uh, of course, the seeds of racism in that. Um, the 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 very idea that these people are somehow inferior uh, for whatever reason, um, whether that's you know inherent in their biology or a, a product of their environment, uh, it is still uh, the, the notion of uh, the inferiority of these people is still um, at the heart of that, that idea of noble savage. And this seemed uh, to, to the European mind to be backed up um, when it came to their, their thinking about Africans by the fact that even after the abolition of the slave trade and the, the great efforts made by the British and other European countries to try to stop slavery as an institution completely, that in Africa there was still a great deal of slavery um, in the interior of the continent and uh, in trading with uh, especially people like the, the Sultan of Zanzibar, you know, the East African coast, and uh, still trading slaves um, uh, across the Sahara um, with, peoples, to the, with uh, peoples living to the north of the, of the desert there. Um, and so that that served as exhibit A, uh, the, the greatest piece of evidence for um, this idea of the noble savage. Um, and uh, there were stories passed around about the the brutality of Africa. Um, some of this is you know associated with uh, reports about uh, the slave trade in Africa, um, but uh, you know th these made for salacious reading. Um, and, and these date back uh, before the 19th century. Um, uh, that we talked earlier in the class about how kingdoms like, or, or political entities in Africa, like the Kingdom of Dahomey or the Kingdom of Asante, uh, were seen as these brutal slave trading places, and um, you know these reports made for good reading uh, to the European mind. And so that was another thing that continued to to back up this notion of the noble savage. Now, in the second half of the 19th century, there was another ingredient added to racism. 
Now, not everyone necessarily held the, uh, this position. Um, this was somewhat controversial. But the addition of this ingredient changed racism into something um, that I think we, we could see as far more problematic and far more sinister. And that is uh, the theories of Charles Darwin um, as applied to thinking about human societies. And so Darwin, of course, is famous for the, the theory of evolution, uh, the theory of natural selection, the idea that, uh, or the, the uh, hypothesis, uh, scientific hypothesis, that species have um, developed uh, and evolved um, and branched off from original uh, ancestor species as they've encountered uh, different obstacles. Um, of course, Darwin famously came up with these theories by um, uh, during a ship voyage, um, especially by visiting out of the way places like the Galapagos Islands and, and observing there uh, in Galapagos all of these uh, differing species of um, birds of finches um, that had different characteristics, and and uh, from that he concluded you know this whole thing about evolution, and with that went uh, the theory of natural selection, which was that only those species that develop characteristics uh, that allow them to survive will survive the ravages of time, that uh, evolution will effectively breed out certain species, um, that they simply will not survive in the face of competition uh, of those species that do evolve characteristics that give them uh, an advantage. <coughs> well, Darwinism, uh, or the theories of Darwin, absolutely rocked the European world. Um, and uh, there were those, of course, there were those who opposed this. Um, this flew in the face of uh, the standard Christian view of, uh, of the creation of the world, um, and uh, among other things. And I don't think that students are necessarily ignorant of these kinds of debates, which continue to rage to some extent all the way till today. Um, but uh, there were those who took the theories of Darwin and began to apply them to uh, thinking about human societies. And again, uh, the, this went along with uh, the, the notion of natural selection here was really important because the idea was uh, that certain groups of people um, have evolved over time uh, to the point where they um, can, uh, they have achieved uh, through their development superiority and thus deserve to dominate others. That, that natural selection actually is the proper order of things. And so it's only uh, natural um, that Europeans who have developed these technologies that none of the rest of the world have, uh, that they, you know, be in this position of dominance. Well, this went along with scientific, or we would, I think, say pseudo-scientific ideas about the human races. Scientists in the 19th century looked at the different peoples of the earth, saw that they had different physical characteristics, and attributed much of that to evolution, um, and in some cases went so far as to conclude that the peoples of different races had emerged from different uh, genetic um, backgrounds. In other words, that these races were actually more like different species that there was a superior species, which of course would be the white European, the Caucasian race, that had evolved much more effectively than uh, the, the, the Negro race uh, in Africa or the Mongoloid race in Asia. I'm using these terms that they used in the 19th century here. Um, and uh, that these were in fact different peoples. Um, and, and that leads to the conclusion, the kind of inevitable conclusion that Africans are somehow subhuman, at least when compared with white Europeans. Now, not everybody ascribed to this. Uh, that is what is known as the polygenist position. Um, this, by the way, is not backed up by any science uh, previous or subsequent to the 19th century. Um, this we we know now that you know, we all emerged from a, a single gene pool, and that um, things like dark skin and the characteristics of peoples in Africa had everything to do with their environment and that uh, they have the same number of chromosomes and the genetic makeup is, uh, you know, incredibly similar um, uh, to all other human beings. Uh, and, and so there were those who took the monogenous position, which uh, proposed that 
all human beings um, descended from the same genetic stock. Um, but this polygenist position was used in some cases to justify, again, the dominance of the Europeans. Um, you know, because if, if the African is really just another animal, um, and Europeans had no qualms about, you know, working uh, oxen or, or horses or dogs or whatever, well, the African was just another animal, right? And, and uh, not really human, and so they shouldn't feel bad about exploiting them and, and uh, uh, even brutalizing them, perhaps. Um, now, uh, the poly, with the polygenous position came the idea um, that in order to be strong, races had to remain pure. Um, and this led not only to the idea that there were these kind of three or four major races, but that each European nation was in fact, it had its it had its own racial makeup, and, and this leads to the kind of thinking uh, that was ascribed to by uh, by national socialists in Germany. You know, where the German race was seen as this kind of authentic race that blonde hair and blue eyes and, and other physical characteristics were part of the the dominant race, but that that race could be and and had been in some cases uh, corrupted by inferior blood, particularly Jewish blood, um, and uh, of course the Nazis. Uh, thought that Africans were also subhuman and, and uh, you know, would have felt the same way about them had they been present in, in Europe at the time. Uh, and had laws on the books about, you know, miscegenation, not, not just with, uh, not just with uh, Jews, but also with any, um, as they called it, inferior race, including Slavic peoples and others. Um, and so this, this has a, a kind of dark and, and sordid history that goes well into the middle of the 20th century. Um, so we need to be cognizant of racism and the role that it plays, uh, because we uh, will see this repeatedly uh, all through the, um, uh, the, the period that we're talking about in the thinking of Europeans as they react to uh, their dominance over Euro uh, over Africa, um, as they justify it. Um, uh, it. It just becomes part of the conversation. And the idea, again, is the Europeans are the dominant race, um, uh, even perhaps the dominant species, uh, subspecies, and, and, and therefore uh, it is their privilege their right even to dominate those regions of the world that uh, are inferior in terms of biological or genetic uh, or um, uh, cultural development. Europeans, uh, another major factor in the scramble for Africa and the, the reason that Europeans were first of all confident that they could take, take over any part of Africa they wished uh, and also the success they had in doing so was the superior technology. Um, there's kind of a famous line from a poem written by um, a French poet, uh, though he lived in England, um, uh, that says, whatever happens, we have got the Maxim gun, and they have not, and they, and this is, this was straight out of textbook stuff, actually, but some, um, uh, they, meaning peoples who were not Europeans, did not have the kinds of weapons that Europeans did. Now, I don't want to overstate this point necessarily. Uh, Africans did have, in many cases, firearms in large numbers. Um, they had had access to these uh, going back several centuries. Um, uh, in most cases, they were inferior to what the Europeans had. Uh, the Europeans, moreover, had uh, inferior, had superior, or had access at least to superior forms of transportation and other things that made them more effective at some uh, proceeding in the in the way that they wanted to uh, in in terms of conquest. Um, but uh, weapon technology, in particular, was the, the gap there. Um, could be great. It wasn't always that great. Uh, really, up until about the 1890s, uh, Europeans were using were, were not using machine guns um, for the most part. Uh, though they did later on, um, they were using breech-loading rifles and um, uh, other things that you know that were not a far cry in many cases from what the Africans had. Um, but there were other 
parts of their technology that were uh, that where there was a pretty good gap. Um, we have seen in our discussion of missionaries and explorers in the last lecture that much of the justification for European incursions into Africa uh, happened along humanitarian lines. The thinking there was that Europeans had a duty to bring civilization and Christianity and, and legitimate commerce to Africa and that this would improve the lot of Africans. Um, and many missionaries had a, a kind of idealistic uh, picture of this. I think we certainly have to ascribe um, uh, racist thinking to them because they did, I think, in most cases, believe the Africans were inferior. Um, but they were worried about uh, treating Africans in humane ways. Um, as the role of missionaries, kind of the direct administrative role of missionaries receded and governments took on direct administrative roles in the growth and development of these colonial situations in Africa, the humanitarian goals remained present in the rhetoric of political figures but it was often uh, combined with rhetoric about the unfortunate necessity of violence. Uh, Joseph Chamberlain, who was the foreign secretary or the colonial secretary of the British Empire at the end of the 19th century, for instance, used the uh, metaphor of, um, or the, the well-worn cliche of, you know, you can't break, uh, or you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. Um, and he said, look, we've had some instances where we had to kill some Africans, right? Um, but all of that is to the greater good. Uh, that this is, um, that even if we have to, to do this, uh, it's justified because Africans are brutal. They're savages and they're killing each other. And in some cases, uh, we have these tyrannical figures in Africa who are enslaving their own people and we have to go in with force. We have to go in with violence in order to stop these things from happening. Um, and so, you know, violence to serve humanitarian ends, it sounds like a paradox. It is paradoxical, certainly. Uh, but in the European mind, this was not necessarily a problem. There is the Maxim gun, by the way. It's a, a, a photograph of um, a Maxim gun from the late 19th century. Uh, this gun developed by a guy named Hiram Maxim was the first truly automatic weapon uh, with a rapid fire mechanism. Um, I forget what the exact firing rate was, um, and the gun could get very, very hot. Uh, but um, this was, uh, this gun may have represented the greatest uh, technological gap between Europeans and Africans that existed uh, at this time. Anyway, now, um, People often talk about, sorry, I'm losing my voice here. Let me take a drink of water. Historians have at times, uh, in fact, this is, we can tell fairly recently, talked about the European conquest of Africa. And by the, the sort of grand narrative or classical version of this, Europeans went in with overwhelming force. The Africans were absolutely no match for them. And uh, the Africans basically laid down before the European armies, and, and the Europeans asserted their uh, what they felt was their God-given uh, or scientifically uh, natural selection-given uh, right to rule. Um, well, uh, that view needs to be nuanced because, with only a very few exceptions, um, and even those exceptions are are so unique that we can barely talk about them in the same breath as the kind of standard way that this happened. Um, uh, with Again, with very few exceptions, Europe conquered Africa, if we can even use that term, with small armies um, in, in terms of Europeans in arms. Uh, so, for instance, the French conquered much of, or established their rule. I'm going to stop using the word conquered here. 
established their rule, their hegemony over the western part of the Sahel, uh, stretching from the, the Senegal River um, into what is now Mali and uh, places in the interior, with only about 4,000 soldiers. And then this, you know, to govern over territories that were occupied by major empires like the Sokoto Caliphate and the Tukalor uh, Empire, um, which we discussed in a you know previous lecture. How did they do it? Well, part of it was the technological gap. Part of it was the Maxim gun. Um, but uh, we also have to understand that much of this was done with native involvement that Africans, in some cases mercenaries, in some cases armies that were loaned to or that allied with Europeans, uh, were, were you know um, given to European command by leaders among Africans who were allied with Europeans against their African rivals. That they did this because they thought it would be to their advantage. And so what we have to, to see uh, if we talk about European conquest or the establishment of European hegemony is a, gr a tremendous degree of native dynamism that, that Africans actually brought this about in large part. Um, and uh, they did it for reasons that were in keeping with what uh, was going on in Africa with the assumptions that Africa had, that, that Africans had. Uh, moreover, we can't talk, of, of course, about the uh, European conquest of Africa. We have to be uh, careful to remember that Africa is a very large and complex place and uh, that this happened um, uh, in regions and locales in their own unique ways. Um, and so... Uh, to generalize and, and simply say that the Europeans overwhelmed the Africans um, is to err in numerous ways. Uh, there were military factors, as we've said. There was a firearms gap. There was also a training gap um, that European armies tended to be more disciplined, uh, tended to work together. In Africa, generally speaking here, and I realize it's problematic to generalize, but generally speaking, uh, warfare gave individual warriors an opportunity to win fame and glory. Um, African wars, for the most part, were fairly small-scale affairs where the individual warrior could freelance. He didn't have to be part of a larger troop. He could, you know, march onto the battlefield or run onto the battlefield and, and start cracking skulls or, or chopping off heads or, or whatever he did, um, throwing spears. Um, and win individual individual fame uh, because the armies were fairly small and these were rather haphazard and sometimes disorganized affairs uh, there was a great deal of individuality to African war well European warfare of course took place on a much larger scale using a lot of um, uh, organization uh, both of logistics and of, uh, of man uh, of, of soldiers um, human resources, I guess we might call them. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, it's understandable why if Africans were fighting in the way that they normally fought, why they were really no match for these highly trained European troops. However, again, oft times, in fact, I think the, uh, the rule rather than the exception was that, uh, the armies who fought in the conquest of Africa were largely made up of Africans. In some cases they were trained by European military commanders, um, but in other cases these wars of conquest uh, were fought by Africans at least partially on African terms, maybe using European supplied weapons in some cases and maybe with some training, uh, but often these were internal affairs. Again, with Africans thinking that they uh, could turn the whole situation to their advantage, that the uh, Europeans, by training them and by giving them good weapons, uh, actually were, were helping them out, and they were willing to pay whatever price uh, in the short or long term the Europeans demanded, or, or maybe they didn't understand what the price would be. I think that's probably more the 
uh, more the case than not. Um, there are a few instances of guerrilla warfare, and um, uh, but not that many, um, maybe surprisingly, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, uh, where there were guerrilla warriors, uh, so for instance in North Africa with the various Muslim brotherhoods, especially in Libya, uh, partly because the Italians had a hard time um, sort of putting together an effective administration there, uh, but um, these Muslim brotherhoods did fight guerrilla war uh, with guerrilla warfare tactics um, in North Africa, and there were a few examples in Sub-Saharan Africa too, uh, but guerrilla warfare was not native to Africa. This was not something that people tended to engage in. Warfare was a, was an open thing. Um, and, you know, once uh, a people, once a, uh, a clan or a, a kinship group or a, I guess we can use the word tribe here, had lost a war, they knew they had to make a uh, capitulation to the victor, um, at least to some extent. And, and so they were operating very much on African terms and, and guerrilla warfare um, was not something that they were accustomed to. Uh, in those instances where they did engage in guerrilla warfare, uh, where peoples in Africa did do this, they were really quite successful. Um, the Maybe the most important factor militarily had to do with internal rivalries. And this is where I would encourage you to go to the textbook and really read all of the examples that read uh, the author of the textbook gives. Um, but um, most of these wars uh, of European incursion, European expansion, were fought using African troops and exploiting rivalries that already existed on the ground. And so, you know, to give an example here, there was a, an intense long-standing rivalry between Buganda and Bunyoro, these kingdoms that stretch back, you know, by this point a couple of centuries. Um, and the uh, the Kabaka of Buganda ended up becoming a close ally of the British, um, and uh, you know sort of loaned his soldiers uh, to the uh, to the British, or or rather fought at the behest of the British against his rivals, um, both internal and external. Um, and so that rivalry was seen as, uh, in the eyes of the Kabaka, the rivalry with Bunyoro or, or some of the other kingdoms in the Great Lakes region uh, were far more of a danger, far more of a threat uh, to their existence than allowing these Europeans to come in and, and uh, have a presence in their territory. That, in their minds, was, was a good thing because it brought more commerce, it brought some advantages to them. Um, and uh, the Europeans were ready to exploit this whole situation. Africans tended to view Europeans through the lens of what they could do for Africans, and and you know, by that I mean how they could help them in overcoming their rivals, how they could help them uh, uh, get better trading contacts. Um, uh, and so they were willing, in many cases, to make treaties with them, to fight for the Europeans, to sort of do the bidding of the Europeans without any notion, necessarily, or at least not enough, uh, of what the Europeans would demand from them or, or what all of this meant. Um, the signing of treaties was one of the major ways that Europeans established uh, hegemony over regions of Africa, because when they signed a treaty with a, a chief or, or a war leader or somebody like that, they would then uh, declare that they were the legitimate governors over that region, that they, um, uh, because they had all of these treaties, they, um, uh, and these contacts, they were, you know, in, ter in European terms, the effective masters over a particular region. Um, Africans didn't necessarily think along these lines. This was so foreign to them that they that it wasn't part of their their imagination or their mental furniture. Um, uh, again, Europeans were useful for many Africans, and this is why they capitulated to their demands, or or at least went along with European plans. Um, they thought it would be to their advantage, and so. Talking about African resistance or the lack thereof, or talking about capitulation, talking about Africans selling out to Europeans and 
um, you know, giving up their, uh, selling their people out and, and all of this in the colonial era really is highly problematic um, as a way to understand African agency. They did things that made sense for them, and we need to acknowledge that. Okay, let's talk briefly about the scramble itself and what that entailed. Um, you can see a map of Africa here, which is uh, circa the, the first decade of, uh, first or second decade of the 20th century, probably around the time of World War I. Um, and I'll explain what all of these colors mean here in a moment. Uh, we've already seen that Europeans were interested previous to the late 19th century primarily in establishing trade contacts and extracting resources from Africa. That having a permanent governmental presence there was not necessarily on their mind, uh, but over time, uh, as more resources were discovered and as other things uh, became apparent to the, the the national interests of Europeans, that they uh, decided to have a more permanent presence there and even to um, establish governments and have hegemonies uh, over uh, over parts of Africa, and a lot of this came out of rivalries. Sorry, drink break. Um, uh, and so there had been a long-standing rivalry going back, well, <laughs> if we really want to talk about it, going back probably to the 12th century, but um, uh, in more recent times, you know, uh, a rivalry between the British and the French over colonial possessions in the Americas, um, uh, things like the, the Seven Years' War um, or the French and Indian War um, were fought for that reason. Uh, this rivalry was exacerbated during the time of Napoleon, um, and it was a, a, a British-led force uh, who overcame Napoleon at Waterloo and, and finally removed him from power. Um, the tension between the British and the French had cooled somewhat uh, over the course of the 19th century, but it heated up again as in the second half of the 19th century, um, British, the British and French were hotly contesting uh, colonial possession of many parts of the world, um, uh, the Middle East, uh, parts of Southeast Asia, East Asia, um, and uh, uh, certain other regions um, as well, uh, even places in the Caribbean and the South Pacific and, and places like that. Um, and so this competition for, for uh, control of land and the ability to extract resources from these far-flung lands uh, went along with a military rivalry over the, I mean, the you know the size of the navy, the power of the navy, and uh, there were lots of factors involved in this. That's maybe the most fundamental rivalry uh, going on in Europe at the time. But in the 1860s and 1870s, both Germany and Italy unify and become uh, unified sovereign nations, and the um, this was due at least in part, uh, it's, it's largely attributed to, in Germany, the work of Otto von Bismarck, uh, in Italy, um, the, the, the work of Giuseppe Garibaldi. Um, and uh, once Germany and Italy had become nations, they were really rather late to the, the whole nationalism game, but once they had become nations and had established themselves, and this is especially the case for Germany, as major industrial and military powers, uh, Germany fought a war against France in 1870, 1871, uh, called the Franco-Prussian War, um, and within six weeks the Germans had marched into Paris and, and taken over uh, large parts of France, and France was uh, forced to capitulate and, and uh, give over a lot of the territory, um, especially in the industrial section uh, of northeastern France, um, uh, in Alsace-Lorraine. Um, uh, to Germany, to the control of Germany, and this had wounded uh, French pride and for the French sense of uh, sense of nationalism. This was a shock to them, and so you know we can see why both of these countries would, for different reasons, I'm talking about France and Germany here, be interested in possessions in Africa. Um, on the part of the French, their African possessions presented the opportunity to recover some of the prestige that they had lost. That the more territory they controlled, the more resources they were able to extract, uh, the, the, the better uh, they could recover from this calamity um, that they had suffered at the hands of the Germans. 
On the other hand, the Germans were feeling really good about themselves after defeating the French, and they decided that uh, they had arrived as a great power in the world. And even though Bismarck really saw not a lot of utility in having overseas possessions, and he said so, uh, for the sake of national prestige and to a lesser extent for the sake of obtaining resources, Bismarck began to lay claim to parts of Africa. Now, how did they put those claims into effect? Well, they sent, uh, for one, they sent agents into Africa to establish relationships with local peoples to uh, get them to sign treaties um, and uh, to otherwise establish a presence on the ground. Uh, this was especially true for places where there was competition between the British and the French uh, who were dominant on the continent or places that really hadn't been claimed outright by anyone. Um, and so, uh, you know, that those are the places that the Germans tended to operate. Um, in, many, in many cases, swiping land out from under the nose of the British and French who really hadn't thought to expand into those territories. Um, and the Germans were, you know, pretty ascendant at this point, and, and uh, the British and French really were in no position to stop them from doing this. Now, other countries were motivated, motivated by other things. Um, the Portuguese were, were trying to hold on to territories they had controlled uh, for centuries but were really in a fairly weakened position. Uh, same with the Spanish to some extent, um, though they were less involved in Africa than the Portuguese. Um, and then other countries like Belgium, for instance, uh, became interested in parts of Africa in the 1870s because they had recently, like Germany, they had sort of recently come into their own as a nation and uh, felt that they, you know, in order to keep pace with other European countries, they too needed to have the prestige of having overseas possessions. And, you know, by the time the Belgians really got their act together, the only part of Africa that was left to be claimed was this part in the relatively inaccessible interior uh, of Africa, the region known as the Congo. And so King Leopold, uh, who really, he didn't want this so much for Belgium as he wanted it for himself. Um, and this is where we come to the, the whole point of the Hochschild book. Um, if, you, if you've read any of that, you'll recognize some of these things going on here. Uh, but uh, Leopold sent the English adventurer Henry Morton Stanley into the Congo to map the region. And with those maps, with that expedition funded by Leopold, um, uh, Leopold then turned around and said, well, this is the land that we have claimed, um, and we, Belgium, this, you know, newly emergent great European country, have a right to this. And he sort of convinced everyone else that, that he did. Um, and so these are the emerging rivalries. Now, what this represents on the ground is really not a whole lot. Uh, with the exception of some of the British and French and, and certainly the Portuguese, uh, the colonial apparatus was not in place in the 1880s. Um, there were a few agents, in some cases, on the ground, uh, signing treaties and uh, doing other things to try to establish a presence there, but there, there's not a lot going on. Um, all, so much of this happens just kind of on the conceptual level here, or via looking at a map and, and uh, drawing lines on the map. Um, so, uh, the desire for empire, you know, on the part of um, uh, pretty much all of these these European countries was was pretty keen, and part of these emerging rivalries. Well, to try to clarify things and really to establish his role as a major broker of power in in Europe, uh, Bismarck called a conference in Berlin uh, in late eighteen eighty four. And he invited all of the European countries who had an interest in Africa to come and clarify who had what possession. Really, this was just to, uh, mostly to be uh, an occasion for Germany to say, we hold this land, and if you want to dispute that, you know, things could get violent. Um, uh, the British and the French, who were, I think, initially sort of scoffing at this, uh, decided that they had better show up um, to establish that they, in fact, held parts of Africa. Um, and, uh, and so they sent delegations. Um, and then others also sent delegations really to make a plea for their 
um, <clears throat> for, for their claims, which were somewhat tenuous. The Portuguese, you know, went to say, we've got this historic claim on uh, this region in southern Africa, you know, what is now Angola and Mozambique. Uh, the Spanish sent a delegation. Uh, and then there were, you know, figures like the Italians and King Leopold, who went there to say, we want some too. And this is the claim that we make. Um, and Leopold had ingratiated himself with lots of other people in Europe. And uh, again, they sort of, um, according to Hochschild at least, kind of gave this to him and said, sure, yeah, you can you can have that part of Africa. Go ahead and do whatever you want with it. Um, and uh, the Italians uh, kind of said the same thing. Like, we're, we're a, a European country too. Uh, we have a great history. We think we should have an empire as well. And... Uh, and so, you know, what land can we lay claim to? Um, and and so that was that was essentially what happened at the Berlin Conference. This took place over several months in late 1884 and early 1885. Uh, they were drawing lines on the map that, again, did not represent necessarily the realities on the ground. Well, what followed that was putting the lines on a map into effect and establishing a reality on the ground. Um, and uh, the factors in this scramble, we've already discussed some of these, but um, in the way that the, uh, the establishing of the reality, as I, as I just put it, uh, took place, had a lot to do with these few factors that I've listed here. First of all, resources. Um, as more and more resources were discovered in Africa, and as Europeans established confidence that Africa was incredibly rich in resources that they desired. They sent real people to um, establish real institutions to uh, put into place governments, to build railroads, to uh, uh, build steamships, to patrol or to, to move up and down the rivers. Um, in other words, they built infrastructure to extract those resources. Uh, key mo a key moment in this happened in the early 1870s. Um, when the British had laid claim in the 1860s, really sort of as a strike against the South African republics, the Afrikaner republics, uh, they had laid claim to this part of the um, northeastern Cape region called Griqualand West, um, which was occupied mostly by people of mixed race descent. Um, and uh, uh, shortly after they had laid, this, they laid claim to that territory, um, diamonds were discovered there huge, rich diamond deposits were discovered there. And there was a kind of diamond rush uh, in South Africa. Thousands of people from all over the world went to this place. Uh, a town was built up around the discovery called Kimberley. Um, and initially there were, you know, just individual claim, uh, claim holders digging for diamonds. Uh, but eventually it reached the point where uh, there were huge open pits that needed to be, um, that, that could only really be mined with equipment that cost a lot of money. Individual claim holders really uh, had no role in this. And eventually, um, a massive corporation known as the De Beers Company, um, with the support of the Cape government uh, and with close ties to the British government, um, based in London, uh, ended up taking control of most of the diamond mining in Kimberley. And the De Beers Company has a long history. It's around still today. It's still the largest diamond company in the world. Uh, and so it's been around for almost 150 years at this point, and it has its origins here. Uh, in fact, if you want to buy a diamond today, chances are you're going to buy a diamond that has passed through. Uh, if you're going to get married or something like that, you're going to buy a diamond that's passed through um, the De Beers Company at some point. Um, and so these resources were, were vital. Um, about 20 years after the discovery of diamonds in Kimberley, uh, in a region to the north in what was then the Transvaal, or the South African Republic, uh, land controlled by the Afrikaners, massive uh, gold deposits were discovered. And so there was a similar gold rush um, that happened there. Uh, and again, corporations played a very important role. Now, I, I see corporations here. Um, because I'm, I'm talking both about corporations like the De Beers Company, who were extracting resources, and companies that were formed by these European governments to administer the territories in question. In other words, the British 
and the French and the Germans and others didn't always, in fact this was more the exception than the rule, didn't always send direct government officials to administer these territories. As they had done in the 17th and 18th centuries, they created corporations that were connected to the government but that ran independently of the government and tasked them with administering these territories. And so, for instance, there was a, uh, a, a company, a corporation established by the British government known as the Imperial British East Africa Company, taking its, its name probably from the old uh, British East India Company or the Dutch East India Company, um, but the Imperial British East Africa Company. And there was one also called the British South Africa Company. And it was these companies who, in many cases, did the administration rather than the governments. Um, key figures emerged out of these corporations who straddled the gap between the corporation and the government. Uh, I'm thinking especially of Cecil Rhodes in South Africa here, um, who was not only uh, a, um, a key official in the British government in Cape Colony, but also eventually the head of the British uh, South Africa Corporation and one of the founding partners of the De Beers Company. And so he, he had his fingers in just about every pie uh, when it came to power in, in, in Southern Africa. And so we must acknowledge that one of the factors here is personal ambition. Somebody like Cecil Rhodes had great ambition uh, to control and uh, to, to establish power. Um, Rhodes had a vision of an Africa that uh, was ruled by the British from, as he said, the, from Cairo to the Cape. Um, and, uh, you know, his, it was his personal goal to make sure that that happened. Um, national reputation was important here, as we've talked about as well. Um, that having possession, uh, having hegemony over regions and having access to the resources that the regions of Africa supplied uh, increased the national reputation and so these European countries put a lot of effort into the creation of these colonial systems. This was done however with a great deal of violence um, and uh, between the mid-1880s and really about the First World War, uh, 1914, Africa went through a period of a great deal of violence. Um, as these European countries were establishing their hegemony over this region. The region that followed the First World War, on the other hand, uh, was much less violent. Um, I don't want to say it was peaceful necessarily, but um, uh, it's, it's that point that we, the, we arrive at something that we call mature colonialism, uh, a time when the infrastructure and uh, the government systems and other things were firmly in place and, and functioning fairly smoothly. Um, now, Let's talk about the role the Africans were playing in all of this. Uh, the grand narrative here holds that um, Africans engaged in, in what would have, would have been called primary and secondary resistance. Primary would be the initial phase of resisting European expansion by those who held political power. Uh, secondary resistance would be af after Europeans had established political control, uh, people rebelled against them in various ways um, to try to get them to leave. Uh, that is too simplistic a narrative. Um, there certainly was resistance to the initial incursions, and there was resistance after the establishment of, uh, of colonial institutions um, and the whole colonial apparatus. But again, in both of these phases, there were uh, many complexities that simply calling them primary and secondary resistance belie. Um, really, this whole process of establishing colonialism could be seen, and I think should be seen, as a continuation of long-term military and political change within Africa itself. The Europeans exploited this, but there was, also, there was already a great deal of violence associated with things like the slave trade, with the expansion of... Uh, kingdoms uh, and empires like, uh, for instance, the Sokoto Caliphate or Buganda or the Tukalor Empire uh, or um, uh, the Zulu Empire in southern Africa, that these things were already underway. And uh, those who had expansionist tendencies among the Africans saw 
the intervention of Europeans as something that could alter the balance potentially in their favor. And so they continued to participate in the same processes of conquest and military development and the establishment of large political hegemonies that they had done already for a century or more. In other words, the establishment of, of colonialism is partly and maybe largely a product of the dynamic 19th century in Africa. And that's a really key point and one that I think uh, we may want to talk about in the discussion boards. Um, we already talked about rivalries and about Africans colluding with Europeans, but again they did this largely because they thought it would be to their advantage, that um, they were more concerned about overcoming their rivals than they were about what the Europeans might do, um, or might ask them to do, might force them to do, if they capitulated to European demands. Um, so the Europeans were really good at exploiting these internal wars, but on the other hand, as we'll see, Africans were at times really good at exploiting Europeans. We also talked about the misunderstanding of these treaties. Uh, this is one of the main ways the Europeans spread their their rule and their influence was to establish treaties, um, which were often very vague, uh, and uh, because uh, Africans didn't necessarily have literacy, um, you know, they would make a, a mark on the paper and Europeans would explain it to them, but they didn't necessarily tell them the fine print. And then these African rulers were often faced with the reality that they had signed on to uh, effectively turning over all administration of the land their people controlled to the Europeans. and. Uh, you know, paying taxes and other things, and so uh, the misunderstanding, and this led to uh, rebellion and, and violence, um, uh, but these treaties were uh, were one of the, the main ways that Europeans operated, and we I think we can probably say accurately this is a rather underhanded way uh, to operate. There were, however, in some cases, requests for protection, and some of this goes back all the way to the Mfekane, uh, the expansion of the Zulu, uh, and the rivalries in southern Africa, or the expansion of the Sokoto Caliphate, and um, you know the other uh, sorts of wars and rivalries we see uh, in other parts of Africa. Um, but uh, in some cases, African rulers actually petitioned their European counterparts to um, uh, to help them, and and even to establish a government of some kind. Uh, in which they could find a place um, to establish, in particular, a protectorate, right? Uh, which is a situation which is still ruled by the natives, but um, where at where Europeans have uh, a role and uh, influence the economy and, and other things. And so we talked in, in an earlier lecture about King Mushwechwe uh, of the Sutu people, um, who asked the British uh, initially to aid him in. Uh, in protecting his land against the Zulu and then against the Afrikaners and uh, uh, by the 1860s he had petitioned the, the British and they obliged uh, to establish a protectorate over what the British called Basutu land. Um, and so a similar thing happened with the Tswana people um, in what is now Botswana, uh, a kind of coalition of chiefs there uh, appealed to the British um, because uh, the Afrikaners were expanding into their territory um, and asked them to establish a protectorate. And the British were, were willing to oblige because they didn't want the Afrikaners to expand, uh, didn't want their influence uh, to be in other places, and certainly didn't want them gobbling up potential resources that existed in these other places. Uh, yet another one is uh, 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 Lewanika, who was a chief among the people known as the Belusi. Um, this is him actually pictured up here. You can see he's, he's donned some European garb. Um, uh, but Lewanika uh, in the region of what is now Zambia uh, uh, offered, or asked uh, the British to establish a protectorate over that area and um, uh, Cecil Rhodes, um, the guy I talked about earlier, was only too willing to oblige with this thinking that that region probably had the same kind of resources that existed in southern Africa um, with gold and diamonds and other things. Now, in some cases, uh, some unfortunate cases, uh, where the Africans were particularly intransigent in resisting European expansion, there were massacres. Um, and uh, we can lay these at the feet, I think, of the um, colonial officials who uh, 
put the strategies into effect. Um, uh, and actually recently, um, only I think very recently, um, the uh, German government, uh, the German Chancellor Angela Merkel, um, issued a formal apology to the Herero people of Namibia uh, for the genocide that took place there in 1905. And so a couple of examples. Um, the British South Africa Corporation, uh, led by Cecil Rhodes, uh, when it was expanding into the region that was known formerly as Nyasaland, uh, where they established a protectorate, what is now known as Malawi, um, they sent uh, an army headed by a guy named Harry Johnston uh, with a number of Maxim guns, and um, Johnston was uh, used those very readily. Um, there were there are several instances of massacres where the British simply opened fire on Africans who were resisting their expansion um, as sort of shoot first, ask questions later kind of mentality. Um, and so that's that's an example. Even more stark, um, and the, the picture down here depicts some of the survivors of the Herero genocide. Uh, this is, I think, a full-blown genocide um, in terms of number of people killed and the kind of strategies put into place to kill. It fits the, the uh, 1948 UN definition of genocide. Um, the Herero were a people of the northern part of what was known as Southwest Africa. Um, actually, if we go back to the map here, I want to point out what these things are. I've neglected to do this. The areas in pink here were British uh, territories. The ones in light blue are French. Um, you can see, for instance, that Leopold tried to claim all of this territory, and the French stepped in and said, no, we want this area just to the north of the Congo River. Um, and they had claims over that area. They had established relationships through treaties with people there. Um, the area in the lime green here, uh, the pastel green, is German. And so Togo um, and Benin uh, and uh, Cameroon and what was known as German East Africa uh, and Southwest Africa. So the Herero people lived uh, up here. Okay, uh, These territories in lavender are Portuguese. Um, and this is King Leopold's territory, the Congo Free State, as it was known. Uh, these areas in kind of, uh, what is that, a lime green? Um, this is mint green, that's lime green. Um, it's almost yellow. Uh, <coughs> these are the Italian claims. And then finally, this area in pink up here is Spanish. Um, <coughs> but just to help you make sense of that map. So um, the Herero resisted German expansion into their territory, and uh, the Germans adopted a scorched earth policy, forced the Herero off of their territory into the Kalahari Desert, and prevented them from reaching any lands where they could find things to eat or drink. And of the 100,000 plus Herero who existed before this, uh, after this, there were only maybe uh, a few thousand, maybe about 10,000 of them. Uh, estimates put uh, the death rate among the Herero uh, in 1905 at somewhere between 80 and 90 percent um, and that was simply the German policy of excluding them um, and so you know this expansion into African territory by the Europeans could uh, lead to t terrible atrocities <coughs> okay um, as Europeans entered these territories and established hegemony over them they sought, in ways that made sense to Europeans, to make some kind of sense of the people they now ruled, to try to understand them. And so, scholars, uh, in some cases col educated colonial officials uh, among the Europeans, sought to write the histories of the peoples they now ruled. And so they did so by interviewing people, in some cases, uh, there were African lore keepers like the Griots of West Africa um, who participated in this. But they wrote up these histories of these peoples. Now, the, the textbook has a really good discussion of this, and I would encourage you to, uh, to read that part closely and try to understand all of this, because the conceptual understanding of Africa and of these African peoples uh, in particular, uh, on the part of both Europeans and Africans is key to understanding how this whole colonial process worked. 
these invented histories were often distortions, in fact I would say were always distortions, of the real histories of these peoples. Um, in many cases there were little more than lists of kings who had ruled uh, over the course of time. Um, uh, but this was done on the European part to try to understand who the rightful rulers over these territories were so they could co-opt them into the system of indirect rule, which I will talk about in a moment here. Africans, though, understanding in some cases what the Europeans were trying to do, uh, contributed to the distortions in ways that would benefit them. And so, uh, for instance, the, the favored people in the Great Lakes region by the British were the people of Buganda, probably because they were already Christian and in many cases allied with the British uh, over their Christianity. Uh, but the people of Buganda contributed to the construction of one of these invented, distorted histories, uh, and they did so, they helped to, to depict that history in such a way that the Europeans, that the British in particular here, would recognize and would thus extend privilege to them. Hopefully that, that explanation makes sense. So the British in this case, and the French and, and others did this too, in, you know, produce these histories so that they could understand the way these African societies worked um, and thus rule through the existing structures on the ground. However, because these histories were distorted, the actual structures that were put into place benefited those who contributed to the distortion. Um, and uh, this the comment here about internal hegemony, uh, had to do, I mean, these, these histories helped to contribute to an internal hegemony on the part of Africans. And we need to see, again, a great deal of African agency in the invention of these histories. This is an image of Cecil Rhodes, by the way. This is known uh, tongue-in-cheek here as the Colossus of Rhodes. You can see that he has one foot on Cairo, the other foot in the Cape. This is his vision of a British-ruled Africa that was part of his larger vision of a British-ruled world. And you can see most prominently here the Lake Victoria. Um, this is partly an appeal to the, the Queen, I think. Uh, Lake Victoria is displayed very prominently in Africa. Um, uh, all of this done certainly by choice. Uh, lines on a map, right? Um, not going to go through uh, details on, on any of these things. The British established Gold Coast Colony uh, in uh, 1900. Uh, the Niger Delta Protectorate then, uh, over the course of about a decade, um, uh, this is the region that uh, came to be uh, called Nigeria eventually. This is the modern nation of Niger Nigeria um, and parts of other, other places too. Uh, so uh, they conquered the Aruba in 1893, then Dahomey and Benin in uh, 1897. Uh, and then finally overcome this uh, the Sokoto Caliphate in 1903 um, and thus controlled this land all the way really up to the Sahara Desert nearly. Um, the Congo Basin, we have King Leopold's Free State, which is discussed in great detail in, in, uh, in Hochschild's book. And you can see from reading that that Leopold was the personal administrator of this, but he did it through corporations uh, who were extracting rubber. Um, which was the main resource they were trying to get out of the Congo. Uh, and they extracted the rubber, of course, by forcing uh, natives to go and uh, harvest the rubber from wild vines, uh, often holding people hostage uh, uh, so that they would do this. Um, and a lot of brutality and a lot of uh, massacre happened as a result of this. Uh, but Leopold was the one who personally administered this at least uh, for about 20 or 30 years until the revelations of the excesses and the massacres and the uh, the huge number of uh, people who suffered from this were revealed, and the Belgian government took it over. Um, and even though they established uh, rubber plantations at that point with rubber trees instead of wild vines, they acted in many cases in ways similar to the way the Congo Free State had run. Um, the most recognizable institution in the Congo Free State was the Force Publique, which was this police force that the Belgians put into place. Um, so hopefully that's enough information for you to you know, be able to make sense of the Hochschild book, which is a really, really good book, I think. Uh, French colonies, though, uh, the French did want a part of the Congo Basin, um, and so they established uh, 
colonies over Gabon, the Middle Congo, and the region known as Ubangi uh, Chadi, um, and uh, this became all part of the French Congo, uh, the modern nation of Congo. Um, in East Africa, the British uh, had control of, of some territory, what is now Kenya and uh, uh, Uganda and the Great Lakes region there. Um, uh, the Germans um, uh, exploiting part the part of East Africa that the British did not have a firm handle on, what is now Tanzania, established German East Africa there. Uh, Italy was given a protectorate over Ethiopia, but then were uh, defeated by the Ethiopians at the Battle of Adwa in 1896. And that was the end of their protectorate, at least initially. Um, they did have a protectorate over Somaliland and Eritrea and Libya. Um, however, um, uh, in South Africa, of course, the British have the Cape Colony in Natal. They established a kind of protectorate over Zululand, also over Swaziland, Basutuland, and Bechuanaland. Uh, Cecil Rhodes, after the discovery of gold um, and an attempt to overthrow the Afrikaner government that failed, uh, known as the Jameson Raid in 1895, then turned his attention to uh, the region north of the Limpopo River, uh, the region that came to be known as Rhodesia after Cecil Rhodes, um, and uh, recruited colonists to go in there and establish uh, hold over that territory. Southwest Africa controlled by the Germans. Um, and this jockeying for position in South Africa led to uh, a major cataclysm, uh, a three-year-long war between the British and the Afrikaners. And um, this is known as the South African War, or pejoratively as the Boer War. Um, and much as they had done in other parts of Africa, the British uh, used scorched earth tactics to try to overcome the Afrikaners, who, who waged a guerrilla war, and so, among other things, they um, took captives uh, of the Afrikaner elderly and women and children, uh, in some cases placing them in concentration camps where they died in large numbers of disease and starvation. Um, and uh, this, th these tactics that the British uh, adopted in the South African War were um, frowned upon by the international community. They received a lot of criticism in the press and other places, but... Um, uh, and the British felt bad about it, uh, official, uh, issuing kind of official apologies and other things, but they eventually forced the Afrikaners to capitulate um, and eventually reached a, a settlement with the Afrikaners to establish what was known as the Union of South Africa, um, which took in uh, the four major entities that had made up South Africa, Cape Colony, Natal, uh, the Transvaal, and the Orange Free State, uh, to become one country uh, under the auspices of the British government, but acting in ways that were mostly independent. Um, and so the British made a lot of concessions to the Afrikaners in doing so, including concessions on the, the point of um, uh, racial privilege. Uh, that uh, they did, you know, whereas blacks had enjoyed, um, at least conceptually, the, the right to vote in the Cape, um, that was taken away from them eventually as part of the settlement uh, of the Union of South Africa. Truth be told, the blacks had never voted in very large numbers in the Cape anyway because they were far away from polling stations and didn't really understand what voting meant, um, at least most of them. Uh, uh, so this wasn't any huge loss um, uh, in terms of historical precedent, but um, uh, these many of these capitulations would lead ultimately to uh, the segregation era, and eventually to apartheid in South Africa, which we'll talk about later. I realize this lecture is going on here, um, but I appreciate your patience um, in uh, uh, going through these issues. Um, uh, we're reaching the end, but there are some still there's still some complex issues that uh, we need to to talk about. Um, so uh, I appreciate you bearing with me here. Uh, we have these phrases that were that have been thrown around by historians uh, that may have been used even in the colonial situation. Europeans talked about knowing the native because the Europeans in most regions of Africa, the only real exceptions uh, to this are South Africa and French Algeria, uh, because Europeans were never, never lived, existed in large numbers in most regions of Africa. Uh, they were really there to, you know, uh, extract resources, to uh, exploit the whole African situation. 
they had to run everything through the native African peoples. And so they wanted to know, and then some of this has to do with the invented histories that I talked about, they wanted to know who the rightful rulers among their African subjects were so that they could co-opt them and use them as agents of the colonial government. Um, but we also have to see African agency in this because those who did hold power within the African societies recognized that if they could convince the British or French or Germans or who, whatever European power you know, we're talking about here uh, was, that they could even have greater power with the backing of Europeans than they currently enjoyed. And possibly, because communication was not always um, perfect between the Europeans and their African subjects, uh, they could extract some concessions even, potentially, to benefit themselves and their, and their uh, cohort from the Europeans. Um, and so, you know, we have Europeans and Africans both working at uh, their own purposes, but often uh, kind of tricking the other into doing what they want. And uh, we, I think we need to especially see this with the Africans who were working closely with Europeans. They often took great advantage of European ignorance to do that. And so the main way that Europeans operated in Africa with only a few exceptions, was through what they called indirect rule. Um, that is, they identified the traditional and, in their eyes, and there's a reason these are in quotes, um, this is somewhat tongue-in-cheek, the legitimate authorities. Well, in some cases, these were not legitimate authorities. Uh, in some cases, the British were looking for kind of tribal systems um, where tribal systems never really existed. Uh, but they were looking for these traditional or, and, and, you know, as they said, legitimate authorities with whom they could work. Uh, they also, in some cases, worked through religious leaders. Uh, but because there were, you know, kind of a lack of familiar institutions on the part of the, of the Europeans, they, in some cases, forced the Africans, or, or rather invented systems. In some cases, the Africans kind of created systems of their own and convinced the Europeans they were legitimate. Uh, so that they would have somebody to, to rule through. Um, now, this, is a, this whole notion of indirect rule, uh, this whole system of indirect rule, is, is tremendously important and, uh, and quite complex here. Um, but uh, uh, to, uh, if you understand indirect rule, you will go a long way to understanding how the whole colonial apparatus functioned. Now, there was a growing group of educated Africans, uh, educated in you know mission schools in many cases, in some cases even in government schools that were established in these African uh, territories, uh, and in some cases even going to England or France or the United States or some some place like that and getting a university education. These people were employed frequently by the colonial powers, but they were employed as middlemen. They held no real authority. However, these were the ones who understood best how Europeans operated. They were the ones who knew the Europeans best, to, to refer to that whole phrase, knowing the European. Um, and so there developed an animosity between this, this educated class of Africans and the chiefs who ruled in these parts of Africa uh, as the indirect rulers. Um, and this tension will be key to the later colonial era and eventually to the, the rise of independence and nationalist movements. Uh, but this group of educated Africans who has their origins in this, this early period of colonialism uh, this is a tremendously important group. Um, and so we can say that tribalism was, in many cases, invented during this period. It was invented by... Now, now there were groups that we could call tribes, I suppose. There were structures on the ground already, but Europeans didn't necessarily want to understand, uh, have any interest in understanding the, the nuances of the African political situation. They simply wanted to know 
whom to co-opt so that they could rule over the territory uh, indirectly and, and effectively uh, in that manner. And so Africans also participated in the creation of tribalism because they took advantage of European ignorance and created, in some cases, systems um, that didn't exist before. Um, they did this to enrich themselves personally, uh, to, uh, you know, to uh, enrich their, uh, their, their family members and their, their, their clients. Um, uh, but, um, you know, I mean, the, here we again see a great deal of African agency. Now, the educated class also, to some extent, participated in the creation or rather the development of the notion of tribalism because they were looking for ways to unite Africans under some kind of recognizable banner. And so as Africans became accustomed to the structures of power put into place by Europeans, they... Um, uh, they also, uh, well, in any case, they um, uh, they looked at these things, these tribes that U Europeans had identified, and uh, took those identities and used them to help construct uh, something that other Africans could get behind. All of these are distortions of what had existed before. Uh, make no mistake about that. These are distortions. But... They're creative distortions. Um, and so, you know, again here, we need to see, to some extent, the continuation of the creativity and dynamism that had marked uh, African history in the 19th century previous to this period of establishing colonialism. Now, there were situations, South Africa, French Algeria, uh, and, in and increasingly uh, British Rhodesia and British East Africa, where large numbers of settlers were brought in. Um, and it was here that Europeans ruled directly, where they did not share power with chiefs or other agents whom they co-opted from among the Africans. Um, and so those are very different situations than we find other places. I had intended to talk about the First World War um, in this lecture as a a kind of conclusion of the 19th century in Africa, but because this lecture has gone on so long, uh, I'm going to save that for the lecture about established colonialism and colonial institutions. Um, uh, and so you can look for that in, uh, in the next video. Thank you.